already been speaking to us uh, would you what is the fixed position of your heart on the matter not a passing idea the fixed position of your heart as God looks on it now and knows us all through and through do you want to be free of it all let's sing the hymn again <coughs> working power in the blood there's enough evidence of that probably in the person next to you or behind you or someone you can see you see there's no doubt about the power in the blood of the lamb it's all the power of God but how about your sin you see it's the, the, the hymn writer's writing a testimony would you be free from the burden of it it's only when you're burdened with your sin that you get rid of it. To recognize that you're a sinner is not sufficient. It's when you're burdened with your sin. So, God, what am I going to do about it all? Nothing doing till then. It's when you're burdened with it. Did you ever read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress? A man never leapt for joy till the burden rolled off his back. That's right. 
Amen. Hallelujah. It's when you're burdened with it. All the time you can keep living with it, nothing doing. All the time you want it, nothing doing. When you're burdened with it. Hallelujah. When it's going to kill you and you know it is until you get rid of it. That's when it all happens. All right. We'll sing that verse again. passion and pride some people are proud of their sin never come to be shame for it proud of their sin hmm. all right the next verse Would you be and stayed with him long enough, they were the people that got the sort of bonus. That after they stayed with him for about three days or so, he required nothing of them, no faith, no effort on their part, just that they stayed around, stuck with it long enough. And he sat down and he showed them that there were providential blessings in the realm of grace, just like there are providential blessings in the realm of nature. Because grace is God's fixed attitude arising out of his nature toward us 
in this dispensation. So they sat down and did nothing but say thank you. At least I hope they did when the bread and the fish was put into their hands. And perhaps beyond what happened in the good old king day, king's day, in way back in Israel's history, when they went home all happy and they had a cake of figs and a flagon of wine, and it was all so wonderful, they went home and said, we saw a marvelous miracle. I experienced it. Um, I, I sat down and I, I ate this food and so on and so on and so on and then somebody said excuse me but you didn't experience a miracle at all um, <laughs> you didn't experience a miracle at all you just partook of the result of it it's not miraculous to sit down and eat food nothing miraculous about that and so people get out in a, in a fantasy world they never really get to reality here, then, is the tragedy. Could overtake somebody in this conference. <clears throat> you can sit calm, you can be gathered, and you can partake of blessings, and no doubt, many will abound. I feel that many have abounded so far. Though we've only had two meetings, and I expect you've had fellowship in the intervals between two. And it's been very nice. <clears throat> but Jesus had come for greater purposes than that. And here is the thing that you and I have to lay to heart. Now there is no way, please will you listen. It's a terrible thing to be deceived. But the worst thing is to be self-deceived. <clears throat> Listen, <clears throat> there is no way into the eternal blessings of God, for it was only a temporary thing to eat bread and fish. They were hungry again at supper time. <clears throat> and this is what people are always crying out. They're always saying they're hungry. They're always saying this. I hear it in meetings. Lord, we're hungry for you. Lord, we're thirsty for you. Or something like that. They get temporary blessings. When you come to a meeting, if you're really in the things of God, you ought not to come hungry, you ought to come so full from your knees. Or something. It's all wrong. People have got the wrong idea. If a preacher man came hungry to a meeting, whatever would you get? Nothing but the reflections of his own hunger. Perhaps that's what's happening. I don't mean particularly here. But it says in the scripture that of his fullness of all we receive and grace for grace. And that was the word made flesh, the man. And so of the fullness of the minister you receive. And that's a tremendous and glorious thing. But that's another matter. I want to say that there is no way into the eternal and abiding life and blessings of God except by repentance first on your part. And if I said to you, beyond an academic expression, so to say, well, what does repentance mean? And you may be able to come up with that old fay. If I said to you, what is repentance? I wonder what sort of an answer I now, not only from experience, but also from Scripture, I want to bring the truth of repentance before your heart. I hope that it has dawned on us all that God did not labor in vain when he raised up a man specially to preach repentance and minister it, and that before they ever clapped eyes on Jesus, the Saviour. They had a clear period to repent before ever they saw the Saviour. Now, have you got this clear? I hope so. <coughs> For your soul's sake. 
repentance. God laid a foundation of repentance long before Jesus started to preach. And then when he came, he said the same thing. Repent. Repent. That was John Baptist's message. He is one of the most important men in the whole of Scripture. I hope you understand this. More important than Moses, if you happen to be of Jewish extraction in the bloodstream, he was the one that God raised up specially performing a miracle you, as you'll know, that he should even be born. And it was to get us used to the idea that God was now going to proceed along a line of miraculous birth. Starting with John Baptist, a greater miraculous birth with Jesus Christ, and a more miraculous birth too for men and women because of Jesus Christ. That I cannot stay and explain at the moment. But he's proceeding along this line. Now before ever men and women got even a sight of it or got a hearing of it, they had to listen to a man saying, Repent! Repent! Day after day they went out to John Baptist. They heard him saying the same thing. He never had a variety of sermons. He never had a black bag out of which he pulled notes to preach on. He never expounded the prophets. He never expounded Moses. Read your New Testament. You won't find a reference to it. He stood there and in one, with one mighty and terrible and continuous voice. He thundered out, Repent! 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 They heard it from morn to night. Day following day, week hard upon the heels of a week. That's how it went on. And it went on after Jesus Christ had come to. He continued it. Repent! He didn't say, well now he's come, it's all over. His ministry was gradually phased out. After Jesus Christ had come. And Jesus Christ took up John's word as though he was an echo of John. Repent! Repent! He said. Repent! I hope also that you're aware, and again I may remind you that last night we were thinking a little over this same ground, though not precisely, that he called his twelve disciples, he named them apostles. He kept them with him for quite a while, and then, you can read about this in Mark 3, the first of the great selective calls, and then in Mark chapter 6, that four, five, and six chapters in between, he sends them out. And they went out, uh, he said, I've got to give you, you know, he gives them power, he gives them cast out devils, he can heal the sick, they can, but this is their, was their message. They went out and preached that men ought to repent. That's what they preached. They also said, be sure Jesus told them this, to tell them that the kingdom of God has come upon them. And so you see, the kingdom of God can only be entered by repentance. clear, isn't it? At least I hope it is. It's written large upon the pages of Scripture. And this is precisely, dear, beloved friend, whoever you are, if you are not in that blessed state of entire salvation, as God has provided it for us in Christ in this age, it's precisely because you haven't come to a true and basic repentance. Now, this was not uh, exclusive to the Gospel era. If I may 
turn with you to Scripture, you will find, say, in the Acts of the Apostles. <clears throat> and here I am quoting an apostle who did not himself follow Jesus whilst he was on earth. That is, Paul. You will remember at that time he was a Christ rejecter as Saul of Tarsus, an educated Pharisee and a Christ hater and a church hater and it proved a God hater though he thought he was doing God's service. Mind you, Jesus had warned his disciples about it he said, the time will come when they'll think if they persecute and kill you, they're doing God's service. And Saul was the great living proof of that. Until that glorious day when God met him. And I want to say to you that at that moment into his life, there erupted a great power of repentance at that moment. Tremendous. And he went about preaching, and perhaps if we just catch it up, in that wonderful chapter in uh, the Acts of the Apostles 20. And he says this. Uh, he's call, calling now for the church at Ephesus. Now you will remember that this was one of the great churches on the earth. Now he's testifying to them that they're going to bear witness. They're either going to say, Paul, you're a liar, or it wasn't like that at all. Now listen to him. He said, in verse 18, you know, I'm in the middle of the verse, from the first day that I came to Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying weight of the Jews and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks' repentance. He didn't say, Ooh, come and learn to dance, the kingdom of heaven's here. And you won't find any of them preach that. Not one of them will you find. Search and see. He went and he said, this is my testimony. I testify to you that you've got to repent. Jews or Greeks made no difference to him. Nor to God. For this man had realized something. And we'll look for it in that great chapter uh, 16. <clears throat> Where, God, where the Lord had dealt with them, I'm sorry, 17, and in the, this time he was at Athens. <clears throat> now, you will know, at least I hope you know, that Athens was a great cultural center in the East. And do you know that, so far as we know, nothing in Scripture that there, to, to say there was, there was never a church founded at Athens. Did you know that? But he stood in the midst of these people of culture and so on, and he says this, verse 28 of chapter 17, In him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also his off offspring, for as much then 
as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God closed his eyes to. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Praise the name of the Lord. So you will see that repentance is a tremendous message and it's a tremendous experience. And may I say again, and I shall say it probably again and again before we're through, that except a man and a woman, a boy or a girl, a Jew or a Gentile, uneducated or educated, except you repent, you'll go to hell. And there is no power in heaven or earth that can prevent it. Except you repent. As I say, God raised up John Baptist specially. His Baptism at that time in water for people who underwent it just meant repentance. That's all it meant. It means a lot more in these days. But in those days that's all it was for. Amen. And listen, he did not believe, neither did God, neither were either John or God prepared to accept that a man or woman had believed the message sufficiently to repent unless they were baptized in that Jordan. That was the sign. Not that God merely believe, believes in mere signs. But the glory of it all is that God laid this foundation so firmly. Jesus Christ taking it up, as we've already seen. The apostles going out in preaching their primitive gospel, for it was only primitive, they could not at that time preach the death and resurrection of Jesus, they preached the gospel they knew. The same as John did, the same as Moses did. They all preached a gospel of a kind. But here, beloved they went out and they said, repent, even if it's into a limited belief, even if it's into a limited experience. You've got to repent. God, again, raises up this other man to whom he gave a special revelation and to whom we are eternally indebted for his great revelation and... Uh, passing on of the message of the church which is his body. What a glorious truth it is. And he went out, and it doesn't matter where he went, and it was unto the Ephesians, I tell you, that he gave the great revelation of the body of Jesus Christ. He said, I testify to you, I did it publicly, I came into your homes, I looked you straight in the eye, and I said, repent. That's it. Publicly, individually, repent. That's what he said. He's saying it to you. I said last night, and it's true, I've lived a fairly long life now. And though I haven't been all around the world, as Brother Edgar has, at least east or west, he's never gone north or south. His name's not Peary or Scott. He hasn't been that way. But uh, um, wherever I've get gone, I've come to the conclusion that the great need in the world is the need for repentance. 
And this is why people do not get in, despite all their believing of this, that and the other. They do not get into God, what all that God has for them, simply because they've never come to a true repentance. And beloved, because God has exercised my heart about it, and because I'm concerned, and because also that God has already spoken in this meeting tonight, he's already said what he would do. He's already given us the call. We all know that he's fully love orientated and his heart is bounding and abounding with grace, then I say unto you that if you will come to a true repentance, then you can answer and come up into all that God wants you to have. Without repentance, you will not have all that God has for you. Is that clear to you? Amen. Now repentance, you and I must understand, must not be confused with such words as regret. There are lots of people who have done lots of things and regret that they have done them. But God did not send out somebody to call us to regret. He sent someone to call us to repentance. And as though John was not sufficient for it, he sent his son to say it. And as though those two were not sufficient, he raised up his apostles to say it. And as though their testimony in their age was not sufficient, he raised us up penmen to give us it in the Bible. And he's raised up translators to give it, give it to us in our own native tongue. God raised up ministers that shall preach it in power and positive, glorious truth that it may be applied to our hearts. For you may as well reach for the moon as reach for the great blessings of God unless you come to repentance. You say, aha, the moon. They're getting on the moon today, but you don't get onto the moon except from a launching pad. Even the scientists don't. You've got to come on the right foundation and ground. They don't start off from the soft mud of Rora. Or Ocken Heath. I have no preferences. <laughs> Neither has God. The great thing about it is, now you've got to get on the right foundation for it. So don't let's get repentance mixed up with regret. Regrets can be genuine enough. If you've never done anything of which you have come to a place about which you've come to a place and say, well, I regret it, then you, there's something wrong with you. Of course we regret things. I hope you'll never regret coming to Roar. And don't get it mixed up with remorse. Remorse is going to be the cause, now are you listening, of those things that you read about in Scripture which go like this, falling from the mouth of the lips of the blessed Lord himself. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Remorse. Remorse can take you to hell as sure as murder and lust and adultery and thieving and inward moral impurity. Remorse. They'll indulge in it. But that's not repentance. Blackness of darkness forever. Remorse. 
Being in torment, you know who I'm quoting. He lifted up his eyes and he said, Father Abraham, I'm quoting Jesus, send Lazarus that he may dip his finger in water and moisten the tip of my tongue as burning remorse, scripture. He could remember it all, vivid. Hell. There's a great gulf fixed between those that suffer remorse and those that have repentance. And so God makes things plain to us. You know, I've been in prison. It's a long time ago now. I sometimes like to say you don't expect jailbirds or ex-jailbirds to come and talk to you, but I haven't got broad arrows on me, not now. <laughs> I've walked round inside prison walls talking to prisoners. Oh, the remorse that grips some men's hearts, not all. Some are so hardened, they never even come to remorse. But some do. But they don't get out because they come to remorse. They're shut up with it every night in their cell. Remorse. Oh, I wish I'd never done it. Can't be undone. Only God can undo things. Only God. <clears throat> While I'm on this note, you'll be pleased seeing that you live quite adjacent to the palace in Dartmoor Prison, not so long ago. God saved a man. I saw him. I only met him last week, I think it was, or the week before. Stood out tall, big and tough. He was making tea. It was lovely. <laughs> God had tamed a lion, made him into a lamb. He got saved in Dartmoor. That's good news for you. What a tremendous thing it is. And oh, to see this man. And even though we were together just for a short week, and only two sermons a day, God God worked on him and softened him. And he came to me several times and said, I can see it. He found me once or twice. He goes, look, I can see. Yes. He... And he was rejoicing in the glory of the truth, beloved, that was transforming him inside. Because he'd come to a tremendous repentance. There is no way that God Almighty Himself can put you straight, blot out your sin, get the record right, and make you acceptable to Himself unless you give Him the opportunity to do so by repentance. I'll say more about that later. Now this is the important thing. I want to say also at the risk of repetition, or I say this quite often, this is the explanation why people, after they say they've been saved and baptized in the Spirit and filled with this and filled with that, have still got vast areas of stuff in their life that's so contradictory to the gospel they've embraced, and so on and so on and so on. It's because they're sort of brought in and has just come to Jesus' position and they're never told to come to repentance. So it's there. It's still there. That's my confession to you after decades of ministry amongst men and women. It's still there. And so they write books on soul healing and mental this. You can go into bookshops and half of them are full. 
with how to get your emotions healed, how to get your, this healed, how to get something else healed until I get sick of it. It's another gospel. You don't read any about it in the New Testament. Read it and see. But we ignore the New Testament and turn to these new gospelers, which is a, not another gospel. It's a perverted gospel. Get a little this week. Come back next week. Six weeks time, come back again. God will do a little more on all this vast horror, this pit inside, this empty ache, this terrible thing that we can't explain. This that makes me act so contradictory to the thing I say I believe. And all the rest of it. As though the mighty blood of Jesus Christ under the plunging power of the Spirit like fire from heaven setting the blood of coursing through you can't do the job. That's why I chose the hymn. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. It's not in your adept manner of applying a certain text to you. There's no skill in it. The heathen never had the Mosaic Scriptures to whom Paul went. The heathen never had the New Testament Scriptures until he wrote them, part of them himself, or his friends John and Matthew did. It's what this man read out. He said, it pleased God to reveal his Son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Called me by his grace, reveal his son in me, that I might preach him. He didn't preach Moses. The early church decided. You may read it in Acts chapter 15. He said, they said Moses had read to them every week. Every week they had the scriptures read to them. Every week they went through it all. Oh, for a mighty coming of the glorious conqueror of sin and hell and death into men and women's lives. And he couldn't get in. He couldn't even begin to get into his ministry until God had sent John Baptist to preach repentance, repentance, repentance. He couldn't begin. He couldn't begin to come with his words. But we borrowed them because they'd been written in Scripture by men. And of course they're true. But they're no substitute for him. So we make a plaster and a poultice of words instead of him. Oh God. We cover the lesion with a dose of Romans 8 or something like that. Instead of him. Oh God. <laughs> Repent! Repentance. Now, you will know, of course, that, that word repentance, right. we simply want to be academic about it, just means a change of mind. Seems so simple. But don't you realize that it's the hardest thing in this world to get a person to change their mind? Have you ever tried it? Have you ever tried to get a person to change their mind? And it's comparatively easy to do what we call change a person's mind compared with what God has to do in that we present an argument. You see, this morning, not that an argument was presented. And if you weren't here, I'm so sorry for you. I hope you, I, I, well, I hope you had a real reason for staying away. God, the Lord presented truth to us this morning that I guess changed people's thinking on certain issues. Let them speak up and say, 
That was a comparatively easy thing compared with what I'm talking about. For when God change, talks about the change of mind, he, cha- he means changing the inward states of it. He doesn't mean changing your mind about thinking what is a cherubim. Yeah? We all have that done for us. I went into a a fruit shop the other day. I'm one of the privileged people. I can go into a fruit shop and pick out what I want and somebody else pays for it. But don't you try that. (laughs) I went in and I saw a box of peaches. And I looked at him and somebody said to me, well, you can have some if you want one. Want them? Well, so I... I, I, He didn't say one. What do you want? Presumably, I could have taken a box full, but... Anyway, I, 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 I saw a nice peach. I picked it up and... I looked at it, and I, then I picked up another one. It said, don't squeeze the fruit, so I didn't do that. <laughs> I picked up this one, and then I went and picked up that one, and then I put that one down, and I picked that one from somewhere else. And what was I doing? Changing my mind. It looked all right, till I got hold of it and turned it right in my hand. And then I changed my mind and said, no, I don't want that. I want that one. That's easy. But when God talks about changing your mind, listen, he's got to change your mind from the condition that can only live with the devil and in hell forever. He's got to change it into the condition that can live with God in heaven forever. That's what he's got to do. Did you understand that? It's not like changing from voting liberal in North Devon because of certain events to conservative. (laughs) It's not that. It's a great dynamic operation of God. And unless you let God do it, you're doomed. You can believe everything. I, I used to live next door to a man... He was an organist in a church years ago now. He knew every psalm. I don't suppose you do. And he had them all word perfect. And he was as unsaved as the seat he sat on to play the tunes. It isn't that. That won't do it. To come into this world of charismata. That won't do it. Use charismatic terminology. That won't do it. Neither will it do it using Wesleyan language like lots of us do. That won't do it. Do you not see that repentance is a great, deep, wonderful, miraculous operation of God upon you and I lay it to your heart tonight in the name of Jesus Christ that you are under direct commandment from God to repent. Commandment. Well, this is a tremendous thing. Look, just look back into that 17th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Here it is. <clears throat> Let, let's, let's go, shall we? The unknown God was speaking in verse 23. Speaking through his apostle. apostle. <clears throat> now, you must not think that because these men were idolaters and they had effigies, ugly or pretty, gold or silver, or studded with precious stones, or made of dung like some of them were, some idols, and that we don't do that, we know better than that, (coughs) that that means that we know God. They didn't know God, They thought he was like this. People in England don't know God and they think he's like this. Or like that. Or like something else. Here it is. God, verse 24, made the world. 
and all things in it. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Are you listening carefully to this? This will show you the determined plan of God in the spread of the gospel. Not that the church has kept pace with God. All right. He's deter determined the times before appointed and the bounds of men's habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. For, listen to it, in him we live and move and have our being, that's every one of us, whether we be sinner or saint, deserving or undeserving, in this element in which our brother was speaking this morning, of the aerial heaven, the first heaven, God is here, moving and in him, as we know that in this universe we exist, so it is in him and by his grace that we're here, and especially in this place tonight, to hear his imperishable gospel. In him we all live, move, and have our being. Now note, the church has been chosen in Christ. There's a distinction here that I don't want to discuss at the moment. <clears throat> All right, let's go on. Your own prophets have said so, verse 28. And then he says, where is offspring? And then he says in verse 30, that the times of ignorance God closed his eyes to. But now he commands all men to repent. You might say, well, what have I to repent of? And so someone may come along and say, well, you've done this, you've done that, you said the other, but it's on this broad basis first. The very fact that God is and that God created mankind and God gives you the breath to breathe, and God that gives you the strength, the strength wherewith you went into sin. You drew a breath that God gave you, and when it came out, you lied with it. He caused the food to grow on the ground, that you should stretch out your hand and hurt somebody with it. Or take something with it. Or put your hand where it never ought to have been. And God gave you that strength. That's why, and presently, for I'm going to take liberties with time, if I may, we'll read it in that great psalm of repentance. David, that tre tremendous man of old said, it's against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this great wickedness in thy sight. In the sight of God, you dared to sin. Using his breath, living under his sunshine, eating the food that he gave. You've got to repent. How can you stop going to hell? Unless you do. That's leaving out all the other reasons. Paul dealt with them on this reason. They were ignorant of Jesus Christ. The times of this ignorance, he said, you didn't know Jesus Christ. He could have said, I'm the first man that's come and preached the gospel to you. And God's prepared to say, all right, all right. But now, from this moment, now you can look back to your mother, to your father, to your grandfather, to everybody else. They all lived, having what was God's, and lived in sin. Now, that's the position. Do you see that? 
That's the foundation of it. You've got to repent of that when the message comes. You say, well, I wasn't... I, no. You weren't held responsible for anything. But once you hear the message, that's it. From that moment, so, I say to you, would you be free? If you would, here is news for you. You can. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Providing that you come to an utter repentance in the sight of God. Amen. It's a wonderful thing to repent. Come with me into the Roman letter. Now, you and I will at once understand that God must be a very good God. Why didn't he smite you down the first lie you told? Why didn't he destroy you the first time you moved against his majesty? Why didn't he do it? Well, we can use the word grace. We can use all sorts of things. But I'm going to use the word that this man Paul used. <clears throat> It's a tremendous and wonderful truth. Verse 1 of chapter 2. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O woman. You say, it says man. Yeah, I know, but I put woman in, you see. As well as man. Thou art inexcusable, O woman, O man. No excuse for anybody. There is no excuse for you my precious friend none you can't plead extenuating circumstances you cannot plead ignorance you cannot plead a merciless God you can't plead inexorable states you can't do it here it is Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. Thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things, and thinkest thou this, O man, O woman, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou should escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? How old are you, friend? How old are you? Ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty? forbearance. You and I deserve to die the first sin we committed. Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. God is good. That's why you're here tonight to hear again this glorious truth. God's been good to you. Don't argue in terms of, well, you know, I've been an ill person or I've not got much money or I went through university and can't get a decent job. Has God been good to me, friend? You're arguing in the wrong realm. We're largely the victims of a world that's now getting too small to hold us all and too defiled 
and too rotten and too riddled and rattled with sin and jiggery pokery and murder and lusting for greed. Don't blame God for what the devil's done. Don't blame God for that. And don't concern yourself with those things chiefly. The goodness of God to you, and He has been good to you, even in the things I've already enumerated, the things that we might call providential in the natural realm. He's been good to you, and He's been good to you precisely for this reason, that He should lead you to repentance. The real trouble, beloved, if I may just refer back to that famous incident to which I've already referred, that He was good to these people. They sat down and they just put out their hand and they didn't have to even have to say grace. How about that? They didn't sing anything like... Uh, Man shall not live by bread alone, or anything like that. <clears throat> they didn't understand it. They just took what Jesus gave them, and they said, well, isn't he good? Isn't he marvelous? Isn't he this? Or take the wine, that was water that was turned into wine at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, and uh, they said, isn't he wonderful? Look at this, our wedding would have been absolutely ruined if he hadn't done this. Isn't he good to us? But he wasn't good to them just in order to be good to them, although he likes to do good things for the sake of it. That's his nature. His hope always was, and still is, that by a succession of good things, he will finally waken you up to the need that you must repent. But people want to keep putting their feet on all the good things and saying, this is marvellous, until they come to a place where they know they're at a full stop. This is one of the great... I know you'll cross me off, and I don't know whether Mar Malcolm will ever ask me to come back to Roar anymore, or Edgar will ever want to minister side by side with me again. But this is one of the great tragedies in this present praise craze that's come. They say, everyone thinks it's by praise. So they've got to keep inventing new choruses, new this, we've got to express praise. You see, it's all being done by praise. It's not being done by praise, though I'm sure some will misquote me and think I mean that you shouldn't praise God. It isn't that. Where are you going to in another few years' time? I'll praise God. Hallelujah. That's not what I'm talking about. But you see, they're all sort of wrong means to get somewhere. Friend, the goodness of God is to bring us to repentance. Lord, my attitude to you has been wrong. My thinking's been wrong. But oh God, I couldn't help thinking that way. There was that in me. We talk about blocks, we talk about frustrations, we talk about eruptions, we talk about all sorts of things. They may not use my terminology. Inside. And I think this or this happens. Why? Precisely because you've never come to repentance. Repentance is the change of that condition. If nobody's ever told you before, that's it. Well, you say, <clears throat> it, it, repentance. It means being sorry. Well, obviously, that's involved in it. But don't think that just being sorry is repentance. Please. For if you do, you'll land up in the same cul-de-sac. No through road. You know that all cul-de-sacs have an entrance. All cul-de-sacs cul have a certain distance. You can proceed to them. See? But isn't it terrible to have to turn around and retrace your steps to realize that this wasn't the through road at all. 
I'm talking about some of your spiritual experiences, aren't I? Amen. Now, <clears throat> repentance. What is it? <clears throat> I'm going back to Psalm 51. Now, I don't think that I need recap all the circumstances from which this psalm arose. Suffice it to say, not for me to advertise a certain person's sin, that David had gone wrong. He'd gotten into sin and he knew it. Now he didn't say, come on now, let's all go down the temple or the tabernacle and sing some psalms. I'm feeling depressed today. You understand that? Somebody didn't come along and slap him on the back and say, now come on, get up, it's all okay, let's go down and sort of praise God. Everything will be all right. If God doesn't get some of these errors right out of our mind... We'll never get anywhere. Listen to him. This man had sinned. That's all you need know about it. What sin is not important? Here he comes. Have mercy upon me. Oh God. According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Wash me truly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin. It's ever before me. You'll never get to repentance unless sin's like that with you. All the time the devil can deceive you, get you to switch your eyes on this, get you to switch your eyes on something else. Read this book. Go there. Go somewhere else. Get your mind off it. Oh God. Keep my mind on it. God kept his mind on it. You say, man, I'll go mad. Better go mad than go to hell. That's God's eternal madhouse. That's the place for the spiritual schizophrenic. People that thought at one time they'd become a Christian, and then they didn't. And they were split. People that tried some road or another, but never got there. Never got to the right one. Listen. My sin, he says, it's ever before me against thee thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest isn't this marvellous that God shuts you up to himself he doesn't say you did this to that woman, you did this to that man, and before that man, or before that woman, or before the society in which you live, before this you are a sinner. He shuts us up to himself. He concerns us 
with our relationship to Him. And you've never got there unless you have. You've never known repentance. Never. That's why all that you say of Christianity is evanescent and doesn't last. It's like the wine on a wedding day or food in the desert or sight in an eye. It's not the reality. Oh God. <laughs> and because this man allowed himself to get shut up to God, he came to a revelation. The revelation is this. You didn't think it was revelation, perhaps. You said, well, I've always believed that this was inspiration. I'm talking about revelation. Here it is. Behold! I was shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Now he didn't read that in Moses. And he didn't read it in Samuel. You search for it and see. This is the first time it comes in Scripture. When that man got before God, he saw it all. He saw himself as a monstrous shape of sin. Ever seen yourself like that? Have you? He saw that his sin was connected to Satan. And he'd been conceived as Satan had conceived in his heart from the moment that he rebelled against God and came against God's greatest and most glorious creation. It was conceived in the devil's heart that every man and woman that should be born from the Garden of Eden onward would be born in sin and shapen in iniquity. That was the concept in the heart of the devil. The devil's your father. That's what he saw. That was a revelation. Have you seen yourself as a son of Satan? Have you seen the enormity of it? Have you seen the dreadfulness of it? Don't say, well, it wasn't my fault. Don't say that. Listen to God. Any place for your mind to go winging off the truth. And God can do nothing for you. As he wants to do, say, bring you back to the foundation of the truth upon which he works to say. Got a revelation because he didn't indulge in excuses. Because he didn't say, Well, I'm in the grip of this, I get in the grip of that, I lose my temper, something rises in me, and I don't know what all the sorts of things. Oh, God. <laughs> Will you listen to the truth? Only the truth can set you free. Jesus himself said it. It's the truth that sets you free. Let's go on. Behold, he says, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. <laughs> Listen, what's that voice answering in you now? What's the thing that's being you, you're saying inside now, in your inward part? Rebellion against the word of God? Resistance to the glorious truth? Isn't that Satan? <laughs> Satan is nothing else than the manifestation and a proof that light can turn into darkness. His name was Lucifer, son of the morning. And that's what Jesus said. If, if, he said, if the light that's in you is darkness, How great is that darkness. He's thinking of something that Peter's going to write by the Spirit. Blackness of darkness forever. Oh God, it's enough to make the very pillars of the earth tremble. And you can sit there.
in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Listen, allow me to say it to you, beloved, until God has made you know wisdom, you're a fool. Say it to me. It's all right, I'm not calling you names. I'm aware of the dangerous ground I'm on. Until he makes you to know wisdom, you're a fool. And you're like your father, who was the biggest fool that's ever been. Lucifer. Son of the morning. Son of all God's wisdom and glorious creation. Until Adam came. And he was a fool. He thought he knew it all. And he threw everything away. On one gamble. And he lost. You'll lose if you gamble against God. You'll lose. You have no chance. Blessed be God for a glorious gospel. Blessed be God for a way of escape. Blessed be God that he came. Blessed be God that someone came and said, I'm the way. What news? What good news? I'm the way, he said. When there's no way... When you've tried a thousand ways, when you've ducked, when you've turned, when you've made some kind of profession or confession, some people preach that penance should be substituted for repentance, and it's a lie. You can do nothing, nothing to make amends for your sin. Nothing. Glory be to the name of the Lord. Here then is the glory of our blessed Jesus. But let me hasten on. Oh, he says, purge me. Purge me with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. Oh, glory. <laughs> he just got the face. He said, you won't have truth in your past. And his mind went back to a time when a nation, at the word of God, took a bowl of blood from the slain lambs and took some hyssop and sprinkled it on the doorpost and on the lintel. And he thought of it all and he was saying, oh yes Lord, but that was all outward. It was on the outward shell. Make me an old truth inside. I've had enough of this outward shell. There are so many people who are in the outward shell of it. Hallelujah. He says, inward parts Lord, purge me. Purge me. Make me clean. I just don't want to be safe only. I want to be clean. I want, I want the sin to go out of me. I want it to go out of my fiber. I want it to go out of the spring of my being. I want it to go out of my reasoning. I want it to go out of my imagination. I want it gone. Gone. I just don't want protection from it. I just don't want this from it. I want it gone. I offer no excuses, Lord. I'm a sinner. I'm the sinner. Oh. He's got it right now. Make me to hear joy and gladness. I'm a broken man. I've broken your bones, says God. I've broken your bones. 
And when your bones are broken, you've got no resistance anymore. That's where God has to bring you. None. Not an argument. Not a word. Not a plea. At the mercy of God. At the mercy of God. What a place to be. Now he's prepared to talk about joy. Good job, some well-meaning but idiotic fellow hadn't come along and said, Come on, David, why not? Let's sing at these lovely psalms. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want... Go away. Go away. I want... I'm broken. What is it that God says about the prophets and shepherds of Israel of old? He said, you've healed the hurt of my people. What? Superficially. That's all. That's my fear. In these days, people are getting some superficial healing. Some superficial this. Some momentary alleviation. I say momentary as against the ends of eternity. Alleviation from suddenly. God, when all my resistance is gone. Lord, Lord, let me hear joy now. He wrote in another psalm, Blessed are the people that hear the joyful sound. <coughs> this is what he was wanting to hear. What was the joyful sound? <laughs> it was the shofar or ram's horn that they blew on the day of atonement. Oh God, the sins are atoned for. <laughs> oh God, the sins are gone. Make me hear the joy, he says. I want my bones to rejoice. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want the bones that you've broken to get up and say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you for breaking my resistance. Thank you for smashing me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thy dead men shall rejoice, says Isaiah. Thy dead men shall rejoice. Ooh. Listen, hide thy face from my sins. Listen, did you see what he said? He's gone beyond the Day of Atonement. For in the Day of Atonement, he hid sins from his face. But here he's saying, hide your face from my sins. Glory. 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 Lord, it must be terrible for you to look upon my sins. Oh, Lord. Perhaps this is why with two <coughs> wings the cherubim covered their face. Ah, my sins, Lord. Oh, Lord. Mm. And there was darkness over the whole earth for three hours. God hid his face. There's no 
no excuse for you. Nothing. It's all been done in Christ. Create in me a clean heart, O God. (laughs) And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Wouldn't that be terrible? Think of it. On that day. Go from my presence. Go. I'm no one to plead for you. Tonight, beloved, Jesus, please. Tonight, beloved, God speaks again. You can repent. But listen, not like Judas. Let's go, shall we, into Matthew. For did you know that Jesus repented? He'd sold Jesus. He was sorry for it. <clears throat> Chapter 27. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented. But listen, it was a wrong repentance. He repented himself. I'll make amends, I'll make restoration. Here's the man that can repent himself. He brought the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the other saying, I've sinned, I've sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? That's the world you've been living with. That's the sinner. That's the attitude seed out of that, cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, departed, went and hanged himself. A repentant man. Why? Because he'd repented himself. You can't work up repentance. You can repent yourself how many times people said, I've got down and I've told God I'm sorry. I've done this and I've done that. And still it happens. Repenting yourself, thank God you haven't got so far as to hang on the end of a rope yet. Of your own slinging. He repented himself. He saw that he was wrong. Jesus had been condemned. I didn't mean that. Why did you do it then? Where did it all come from? If you didn't want him condemned, if you're saying now it's all wrong, then you're sorry, why did you do it? I know it was inside. Love of money, the root of all evil. He hanged himself. A suicide. And in chapter 1 of the Acts of the Apostles it says that he went to his place. Mm. That's what death will do for every one of us. You'll go to your place when you die. That's what will happen. That he might go to his place. Written in the scriptures. 
He repented himself. Now these self-made repentances avail nothing to God. Did you know that? This seeing the result of your action, wishing you'd never done it, and we all ought to have been there, and saying, I'm sorry, Lord, I repent, I repent. You never got to repentance, beloved. Until something tremendous has happened in you, far beyond what you can work up for yourself. If you could work up repentance, you would be responsible for your salvation. Listen, the scriptures shall teach us, we'll turn into the Acts of the Apostles, shall we? And hear what this mighty man Peter says. Had we read in the last verses of the 26th, the the chapter preceding where we read in in Matthew, we would have read that Peter had denied him. (coughs) Peter had denied him. And listen to what he says. He's speaking in chapter 5 of the Acts of the Apostles. The God, verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted. Hallelujah. The exalted Jesus. And I want to say the exultant Jesus. Now, Exalted with his right hand, a prince and a saviour, for to give repentance. He commands repentance. And you may say, I haven't got it, I haven't got it. He says, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. Repentance is a gift. glory. He gives as a prince gives. Hallelujah. And not the princes or gnomes of Zurich either. Or the OPEC shakes. Hallelujah. He gives repentance and forgiveness. He doesn't give forgiveness before he gives repentance. Don't you think he does? He gives repentance and forgiveness to Israel. We are his witnesses of these things. That's what Peter said. I told you, just before we read in Matthew, he just denied the Lord with an oath. And, and, uh, and he, Jesus is condemned. Judas comes back and repents himself. Flings the money away. Blood money. I don't want it. Blood money. Enough to drive any man demented. To betray the Son of God. Peter. Oh, blessed be God. Jesus had gone to him. And had given him repentance. I know what happened. When they said, Jesus, he's alive. He, and he's, he's been to Peter. He gave him repentance. He gave him repentance. Hallelujah. He said, I'm a witness of this. This blessed prince. This prince of all virtues and love and grace. This prince of men and of God and of angels. This prince in his manner and manners. Oh, he gave me repentance. I'm the witness of it. I'm the living evidence that God gives repentance and out so am I. Hallelujah. I'd stand with my blood brother Peter for like him I was in sin. And God gave me repentance. He gave it to me. Oh God. It plumbed my depths. It reached the heights. It broadened my spirit. It enlarged my understanding. 
I came to a place where I told God that I'd go to hell if he sent me because I knew I deserved it. I knew it was right. I said, I don't want to go, Lord. And unless you know it's right that you should go to hell, you haven't really begun on this great road of repentance. You haven't begun. Though God's been good to you, He's withheld the thunderclouds of His wrath. He's held them back. He's been good to you. He's done marvelous things for you. More marvelous than you'll ever dream of. Or I either until I get beyond the pale. He's been wonderful. 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 He gives repentance. He gives forgiveness. <laughs> Hallelujah. This blessed Prince. This glorious God. What can I say of Him? How can I describe Him? He'll give it you. He'll give it you. Would you be free from your burden of sin? Would you be free from your passion and your pride? Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's whiteness upon the everlasting hills of God. His heavenly Zion that will make snow blush with shame. And its filthiness comes out of the purity of God who imagined and created snow to give us some idea some dim picture of what his righteousness and holiness and purity is. Burning whiteness beyond the cold whiteness of snow, a whiteness that snow has never known. Make me clean, O oh Lord, Make me clean. Have you ever come there? It's all a gift. Don't labor anymore to bring your unwilling feet into the way of righteousness. Don't labor anymore to come to some kind of sorrow of your own. For, listen, God will give you such sorrow if you'll let him. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and this is what he told them in his second letter to them in the seventh chapter. This great, great truth of repentance. Listen to it. Oh, thank God for the times my heart has gone over this section. Think not, will you? I don't know. I'd like to ask Brother Edgar. I don't think I need. Men who have to minister in these things of God, their mind always goes over these things. Listen. My mind goes over it again and again and I turn to it and clasp the book to me again to read it. Here it is. <clears throat> Paul writing to these people. He says, <clears throat> let's start in verse 8. We're breaking in. I'm aware that time is going. And he says, I made you sorry with a letter. I don't repent. So I did repent. Here's one of the times I tell you when dear old Paul was absolutely shattered inside. First, he says, I repented when I'd written it. I said, oh God, what have I written to these Corinthians? When you read that first Corinthian letter, you read it with tears. That is, you'll never read it rightly. 
And that's why the scripture is a mystery to so many people. They can't explain it or understand it. They don't come in the right attitude. They can't. They're a long way from it. He wrote it with tears. It was though he dipped his pen in his blood, if not in his blood, in his tears, to write it. He said, and I was sorry. I repented. I told you these things, I told you those things I said to you, if you defile the temple of God, God will destroy you. And he'd been there, and out of his own life's heart, blood, and truth, he'd preached these people into being. In God. You've had so many teachers. You can't have many fathers. I declare the truth to you. In his breaking heart, he wrote that first Corinthian letter. They'd sullied the communion table. They'd ruined the gifts of God. They'd done everything. Laid their sin upon the pure things of God. He said, I was sorry. They said, no, I'm not sorry. Oh, the conflict that went on in this man. He talks about inward conflict. Not the thought about sin. The sort for souls. That's right. And he says this, I perceive, in verse 8, in the middle of the verse, that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though uh, but for a season. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. What is that verse that says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning? When it's the morning of God and you're weeping at the tail end of night's sin. Now, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For, listen to this, every word is worth its weight in gold. Listen. You were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now you're going to see it's godly sorrow only that will lead you to repentance. It's godly sorrow about sin that will make you feel burdened with it, cluttering up to you, your inside. Can't get rid of it. Godly sorrow. Amen. He'll make you see that the things in which you took pleasure broke his heart. The things you did, the attitude you adopted, this thing that you transacted broke his heart. You went away his heart. It's nothing. It's nothing. Listen. Here it is. Have a good look at it. Verse 11. Behold this self same thing that you sorrowed after a godless sorrow. Here's the proof of whether you sorrowed after a godly soul. Here's the test. What carefulness it wrought in you. Hmm. What clearing of yourselves. Oh, glory. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, revenge in all. I'm going to put these things. You know, things is italicized, isn't in the Greek. In all these things, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Amen. That's what true repentance does. Clear of it. Gone. Out of 
the substance of your being. Gone. Glory to God. No longer creeping about doing things. Gone. <laughs> Glory be to the name of the Lord. Glory be to the name of the Lord. That's true repentance. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. Work if repentance. It's all, all a gift. <clears throat> Praise the name of the Lord. <clears throat> what do you think happened in Gethsemane? Gethsemane. I'd like to be able to preach on it for the rest of my life. I'd like to become... Acquainted with all the glorious fullness of it all. I would. When he couldn't cry anymore. He could stand and weep outside Lazarus' tomb. He couldn't shed a tear in Gethsemane. It was beyond it all. Godly sorrow gripped him. And his tears came out through the pores of his flesh. Sorrow. 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 Godly sorrow. Presently, not far distantly, his sweat mingled with his blood. Sorrow. 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 And they pierced his side. And what couldn't come out of his eyes rushed out of his riven side. Sorrow. Sorrow. Oh God. You've got to repent. Deeply, deeply. It's a miracle. Say, I wish God would do this miracle for me. I wish God would do that miracle for me. I wish you... <coughs> Listen, beloved. This is the miracle. Oh, Lord. Do it for me. With sorrow I say this to you. There are some people who get to such a place that even God has to say it's impossible to bring them to repentance. Paul writes about, I'm quoting the Hebrews now, now Paul writes about them and he says, they're implacable. Implacable. Or again, that was the first chapter. In the second chapter, he says, After thy hardness and thine impenitent heart, thou heapest up wrath against the day of wrath. Are you heaping up wrath in God's heart against you, this God of love, this God of grace, this God of blood, this God of redemption? You say, don't talk to me about it. Tell me about his love. It's in love, I tell you. 
It's in the Scripture. I shall preach about love, I dare say, sometime this week. But never greater love than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. Out of his own lips it came. And you can have it. Will you be free? Will you let him do it? Will you respond from the depths of your beings as the blessed Jesus responded from the depths of his when Father said, Son, it's the cross. Yes. It'll break my heart, Father. You've got to have yours broken, son. You've got to have it broken. You've got to have the stiff, stubborn, bony framework of you. God will do it. And now one last word. You've been patient. I love to tell this story. I don't make them up. I can't be a storyteller, I guess. I just want to tell you the stories of Jesus. A certain man had two sons. You know what I'm going to say. The younger one said to his father, he said, Father, give unto me the portion of goods that devour, fall it unto me. His father did it. Not long after, he gathered together all, went into a far country. And there, he wasted his substance on riotous living. He was absolutely in riot against God. Perhaps that's your condition. Rioting against God. Rioting. Do you know what a riot will do? Let a riot go unchecked and it will overthrow a country. That's why God stopped the devil's riot in heaven. Same spirit. Same seed, same thinking, same attitude, same works. And you know the rest of the story. Bless God, let me come quickly to him. If, as he finished up at the swine troughs, he sat there and when he came to himself, he said, How many Hired servants of my father's have bread. <laughs> Nothing to spare. And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. See, he's in exactly the place where David was, he said, Against thee, the only, have I done this great wickedness in thy sight. Done it before thee. Listen, you did it before the Lord. You shut yourself in a private place. There was no one there except God. You did it right in front of his face. Darkness cannot hide thee. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and fly in the light to the uttermost parts of this, thy spirit is there too. You said, come, let's go to our closet. Let's do this. Let's do that. In the sight of God, you did it. 
You ever heard the expression about flying in the face of the Almighty? And the Almighty stooped yet lower to bear his heart the more completely that you may know that he still loves you. He arose and he went to his father. While he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and he ran. He fell on his neck and he kissed him. And he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he said, bring forth the best robe. <laughs> I put the best robe on this repentant spirit. That's right. God gives repentance the best. No, you know, you know he'd been sitting at the swine toss. You know he stank. He literally stank of pig manure. Hey, then does God put a robe round the dirt? Yes, he does. The outward dirt. Because inwardly he was already clean. He'd repented. And God says, well, we'll deal with the rest now. All these sort of outward blemishes, we'll just put him in a tub, he'll soon be clean. He got rid of the sin by repentance. His attitude had changed. His mind had changed. In its substance. We'll deal with the rest. <laughs> Put a ring on his finger. Put shoes on his feet. Come on. Let's rejoice. Now that's what God's attitude to you is. If you repent, you might say, but I've got risk to get rid of. I've got this at home. I've been doing that with somebody else. Listen. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you, you'll get rid of that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Have you repented, son? I'll give you repentance. Absolutely. Don't you sit there trying. God sends a man to preach repentance. God says, repent! 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 You're under command to repent. You're under the preaching of repentance. They went out and preached everywhere that men should repent. Wherever they could find them. You're being apostled to God. Whether publicly or privately. Talking to you in your home and straight to your face. Repent. Peter, how did you get there where you got? I came via the road of repentance. Yes. Paul, how did you get there? Oh, I realized that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh Lord. Thou would not despise. John, how did you get there? I came via the road of contrition. Andrew, how did you come? I repented. Whatever you do, don't sit there as though you're innocent. Don't sit there as though you're going to brazen it all out. Don't sit there thinking none of these people know me. God does. Bless He loves you. He loves you. Can 
anyone save more. If you will repent, God will die. Lord, I will repent. I will repent. We're going to sing hymn number 288 in the Red Book. Be from your burden of sin there's power in the blood tonight. Would you be free from your passion and pride? Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? power in the blood. Come for a cleansing in Calvary's tide. There's wonder working power in the blood. Hallelujah. We're going to sing it. And you come and let the Lord do the work. If you can put up with your sin, sin another day, God can't. Oh God, let's pray now before we sing it, shall we? Lord, Lord, <clears throat> God, Thou God of the universe, Thou Head of the Church, Thou Spirit of conviction, come now and convict sinners of their sin. Lord God, lay the weight of their sins upon them, crush them, Lord. Break the bones. Lord, till all resistance to truth goes. Until they come to thee, naked and undone. O oh Lord, who sends thy word to heal us all. Blessed Redeemer, work thy work now. We'll stand to sing 288.
Would you be free? Would you be clean? Would you? Would you? If you've lived with sin so long that you can't live with it any longer and you want to be rid of it unto the death of it. And I tell you that Jesus' death will be substituted for yours. And by the blood that flowed there, you will be cleansed. Resist it. And what will become of you? I give you an invitation to respond and come and kneel here. If you've never known this true repentance, you say, Lord, I receive it from you tonight. The gift of God's love. If you've skated about in Christian things, or charismatic things, or whatever else you want to say, Pentecostal, matters not to God. Here then, God is dealing with sin. He's not in the cover-up business. I give you an invitation to respond. We'll sing the first verse again. And after that I'm going to close. We'll sing the first verse and chorus. If you're going to respond, do it now. Once and for all. So that if I come back in six months or twelve months time and preach again, you won't be out here again for repentance. Then it will be real and true. All right, we're not like Pilate washing our hands in water. We're sinners being plunged in the blood of Christ. Repent, son. Repent, girl. Repent, man. Woman. That's the commandment. God will take you on from there. Would you be free from your burden of sin? Then fire in the blood, fire in the blood. Would you only get the victory with that wonderful fire in the blood? There is Satan hold you back. You may never hear repentance preached again to you. I declare to you that I've never preached it before as tonight. Don't stand there. You're on the most dangerous ground you've ever been on in your life. Yet on the most blessed. Can you? Conference, let him tender it. Don't harden your heart. Because your conscience is the most delicate part of your heart. Stop God there, and you stopped Him everywhere. I declared unto you, testified unto you, 
publicly and from house to house, repentance toward God. And, here's your next step, beloved, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. If you repent, you will have no difficulty in believing. That Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ's blood avails for you now. Amen. That the cleansing will go through your being now. You knelt there black. <coughs> you will rise whiter than the snow. Hallelujah. And if there's anybody kneeling here that soils their cleanliness of yesteryear or yesterday, then for you too, with pleasure the Lord cleanses. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And are we not all together and individually in need of that cleansing now? This constant cleansing of this blood of Jesus? Am I not? I am. Oh, yes, Lord. I need thy cleansing moment by moment. I need it. I need it. You can rise from your feet if God has done the work in you and know that you're going in the glorious footsteps of the beloved. Washed within and without. Hallelujah. Washed right down to your roots in the past. Cleanse out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A new creature. A new song in your mouth. Joy. The mending and healing of your broken bones. The glory of life in Christ. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Be free. In Jesus' name, be alive, utterly alive. Hallelujah. Glory, glory to the name of the Lord. And if there is someone here that's held back, fighting against the truth, I offer you nothing. Except pray that the blessed grace of Christ should continue to strive with you. And the Spirit of God should not cease His working upon you. To bring you to repentance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to the name of the Lord. Amen. Lord, these that have knelt in thy presence as kneeling before thy throne. Lord, how wonderful thou art to call us all, deal with us all, that we'll be honest and true enough, clinging to nothing secret or inward and doubting nothing. Hallelujah. Bless thy wonderful name. We glory in thee. Unto thee, Lord, we commit them. Blessed Spirit of the Lord, work thy miracle in them. That they may this night lie down with joy and sleep in peace and rise in the morning in thy love and walk in thy ways of wisdom and righteousness. 
and be holiness unto the Lord all the days of their life. Amen. 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 The Lord bless you. And to him you've bowed the knee, and to him you've made your confession. From him you have received the gift, and by him you live. Glory be to the name of the Lord. Amen. Let's all rise and sing, shall we? I've chosen the hymn. God's love. Rejoice in it. Let him lay the seal of his approval in your heart. And you'll go home tonight crowned by the prince. Hallelujah. <clears throat>
Let thy spirit seal it all in every heart. The benediction of God. The priceless blessing from on high. The whisper of God in the soul that all is well. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Amen.